Uh, evening, ladies and gents. Simon Brown here doing this first JC Power Hour of the year. We're going to be talking tax free. Uh, I'm going to start with really simple. So if I start this presentation and you think to yourself, hang on a second, I know this stuff. Bear with us. We'll catch up with your knowledge soon. I want to keep this for, uh, for the basic and then we'll get really technical at points in it. But we will start it simple. We'll start with a picture of a cat. My screen is there, so you'll note I look at it from time to time. Why a cat? Because last year we had a scared cat at that first slide of our first power hour. Um, and, uh, well, it was a scary year. Different to what we thought. Bear markets and tech sell-offs and all of that sort of stuff, which certainly meant uh, a whole different game. But nonetheless, uh, there's a pretty cat to start the picture. So what are we talking today? We're talking shares. We're talking indices. We're talking ETFs, and then ultimately, that is all around tax-free investing. And the tax-free component is hugely important. We'll delve a lot into that as well. But what are shares? I mean, shares are companies that you interact with. You, you might bank with some of them, and all the big banks are, are listed, the, the retailers. Uh, you know, you went to ShopRite today or Boxer, uh, Spa, whatever the case may be. The businesses that you know. And what you can do is invest in these businesses via the stock exchange, the JSC. You need a broker, you need an FSP, as the case may be. That's some technicalities in that regard. But what the JSC does is it enables you to buy and sell those slices of a business. You know, ShopRite's probably worth 100 billion zar. I ain't got 100 billion to buy ShopRite, but I can go buy a slice of ShopRite for 250 rand. And that's what the JSC does. As an owner, you get invited to the AGM, annual general meeting. You can vote on important issues, and you can also get your share of the profits, and we call those dividends. So I'm going to check everything is flowing. Yep, audio is working well. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, drop them into the Q&A box. I'll take them at the end. People are asking if we're recording. Yes, we are. It will be on the Just One Lap website. Uh, let's say late this evening, justonelap.com. So you've got these listed companies, these shares that you can invest into, and they're on the JSC. It's not every company. It's about 400 in South Africa. It's a couple of tens of thousands globally. And they are mostly the big names, although in some cases a little bit smaller. So that's the base of it. There's various different stocks that you can buy individually. But what we then do, or what the, 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 the JC does, is they take it a step further and they create what we call an index. So we've got, for example, gold shares. We've got PGMs, banks, insurers, retailers, and the like. And those are how you would classify them. ShopRite is a retailer. Uh, Standard Bank, Capitec, FNB are banks. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Sabanya Stillwater, Anglo-American, uh, Kumba Iron Ore, they are miners. Sabanya Stillwater, uh, a PGM miner. So they get their classifications, and then they drop into indices. So let's take, for example, the Resi 10 index. We call it the Resi 10, and it's got the 10 biggest mining shares on the JSC in that particular basket. Now you can actually go and buy that Resi 10 via an ETF. So you can go and say, you know what, I think mining's the place to be and I wanna go and buy an ETF. What does the ETF issuer do? And this will be Satrix, Signia, Absa, Core Shares and the like. One Invest, they go and they buy those 10 shares, put them in a basket and sell you the basket. And then as those 10 shares are moving up and down, there's an average move and your basket that ETF, exchange traded fund, will move in sync at the same time. And that's hugely important. You're capturing the, all 10 of them. And the point is, it's lower risk. If you went and bought just one of those miners, it might be a knockout, but they might run out of gold or whatever it is that they're mining. They might have floods at their mine, strike action, whatever the case may be. By having 10, you reduce that risk. As they make profits, they will pay dividends, typically biannual, sometimes once a year. And those dividends will flow to the exchange-traded fund provider, and then quarterly or perhaps biannual, they will pay those dividends out to you. So we've got here an industrial one, which we've got 25 stocks, the Finney with 15 stocks, the Resi with 10 stocks. But each of those are a little bit niche. What happens if you bought the Resi and it turned out all the action was happening in the industrials? Well, then we have what we call a top 40. And that's the sort of the big index in the market. That is the 40 largest companies on the JSC. So in there, you've got some resource mining stocks, financials insurers. You've got industrials and, and, and retailers. And now you get that broad basket of 40 shares. And any one day, one of those shares might be up or down 5, 10, maybe 15%. 
But because they are part of a collective, of a basket within that exchange traded fund, your ETF is going to be less volatile. If you hold a share and it falls 15%, it's going to be a nasty day. But if you hold an ETF and one of the shares falls 15%, you might not even notice it because all the rest are up. It gives you that average return over time. And that's what an ETF is. It enables you to buy a market. The benefit is it's what we call passive. In other words, you're not deciding, well, I want to buy this share, not that one. What you're saying is, I want to buy a market. Why do you want to buy the market? Because it's the best performing asset class over the long term. Given time, the market creates wealth. There's an example. You can see that chart goes back uh, 10 years. And you can see the collapse, the COVID collapse in, in early 2020, which was a horror at the time. It's absolutely recovered. Over time, that basket will increase in value. You will create wealth. And you can buy it direct from the issuer in many cases. You can also buy it via a stockbroker or financial services provider, an FSP. They're typically fairly cheap. They from 10 Rand, maybe the expensive ones are up around about 100 bucks, 80 or so there's around, but they're easy to buy and they give you that nice diversification so you don't have single risk somewhere. Okay, so now we've got a sense of what an exchange traded fund is. There's also an exchange traded note. I'm not going to run down that rabbit hole. Collectively, we call them ETPs. But what did ETPs do? Let's have a quick look at ETPs last year. Well, there was a ton of red. And I know you're all quickly trying to find your, any that you might particularly have owned. Truthfully, don't look at the screen. If you owned any of them, you know that you owned them because you saw the pain. Those are one-year returns, calendar year 2022. But some of them really have got the five-year CAGR, which is compound annual growth rate. In other words, the average return over the previous five years, you will note they were all green. Not all of them have been around for five years, so we don't have CAGR for all of them for a five-year CAGR. But the key point is, is that's what markets are about, long term. 2022, as happened last year, will happen from time to time. And it is no fun. I've been through uh, half a dozen or more, probably 10 or 12 bear markets. I'm never going to tell you I like a bear market. But the thing is, is that they pass. And many of those losers from last year are already having a good 2023. Here's the winners from last year. And it's an interesting list. Namibian bonds at the top. It's crazy. Namibian bonds. I mean, who would have thought that at the beginning of last year? But what you also note is there's a bunch of sort of what we would call smart beta. In other words, that top 40 I referred to earlier, it just buys the 40 shares and it buys them in the ratio. So it buys more of the biggest and least of the smallest. But a smart beta says, hold on, we can get a little cleverer about that. And we can focus on perhaps dividends. We can focus on perhaps a uh, 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 some methodology, the RAFI, Research Affiliate Fundamental Indexation, bring a little bit of fundamentals into the process. And we saw a number of those doing surprisingly well. So do have a look there, because if you owned any of those, you might have missed it because of all of the red that we saw last year. It was a horror year last year. It happens. We've had them before. As I say, we'll have them again. The ETP industry in total, a, sl a slight decrease in the, the RAND value. Uh, that primarily, not so much because people were taking money out of the market, but more because the market was going down. Now, the South African market was pretty much flat for the year. It was the offshore markets, particularly US, S&P 500 and NASDAQ that got hit. And that's one of the beauty of, of uh, the uh, ETFs on the JSC is that I've been talking South African companies. But you can also buy ETFs that represent or track offshore. So the NASDAQ 100, for example. And what the issuer will do is they'll take your rands, they'll convert it into dollars, and they'll go and buy you those top 100 shares in the NASDAQ. So now you've got two drivers of return. One being is the NASDAQ going up or down. Two is the rand going stronger or weaker. So you get offshore exposure. It's not part of your offshore allowance. It can't be settled in dollars. It will be settled in rands in South Africa. But you can also get that offshore exposure. Uh, we saw nine new ETFs coming through. We'll touch on those nine in a moment. And we did see a, a couple of ETNs become AMCs, which are essentially active products in the market. I, I'm going to park those aside because they get technical. Uh, what we'll probably look to do is a dedicated uh, uh, webcast on those alone. But let's look at some of those new ETFs that came to market in a moment. The biggest issue is Remain Satrix Insignia. Uh, Satrix is taking over much of the ABSA ETFs, which will make them by a long way 
the, the, the largest issuer in South Africa, uh, and Cloud Atlas right at the bottom, the smallest, is being bought out. But we'll touch on those details. So some new ones. There was a Cautious Wealth Government Bond ETF. Uh, we got a One Invest ICE US uh, short dated treasury. Now, what's very important with that ETF, it is more around tracking the move in the RAND dollar exchange rate than much else because it's trading such short term uh, US treasuries. Uh, we got uh, One Invest uh, EMA, which is Emerging Markets Asia which is nice. We are an emerging market and you get some emerging market exposure, but this gives you a lot of China, a lot of uh, South Korea and other uh, in, in that space. We also got a Satrix India. Some of these you will notice has got a slightly higher TUR just because of the costs involved. For the newbies, TUR, total expense ratio. That is the fee that you will be paying to hold it. There are a couple of fees. You've got to pay a transaction fee when you buy and when you sell. Your broker might charge you an admin fee either monthly or annual admin fee. And there will be a fee for the fund. Much if you buy a unit trust, there will be a fee for that unit trust fund at the same time. Now, these fees are typically very low, many of them around half a percent or down. Sometimes you'll see, for example, that India is 0.82%. That is running a little bit higher. We expect that in some of the, the more niche and especially some of the EM ones. India is interesting. Overtaken China in terms of population, and certainly one to watch. We've got a Citrix Healthcare, uh, Global Healthcare ETF, so it's not focusing on South Africa at all. Uh, nice health is certainly, you know, forget the pandemic, health is important because we're living longer. And because, and why are we living longer? Well, because of healthcare, but it means we're spending more. It means we're, we're spending particularly in our old age, but even when we're younger, there's a lot more we can spend on health. There is a regulatory risk because of the cost increases in healthcare, but aside from that, health is a nice one. The Satrix uh, Smart City Infrastructure, this one's a little bit weird. It's trying to say, you know, what are smart cities around? They're going to be around uh, 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 transport. They're going to be around uh, uh, data, internet, broadband access. They're going to be around renewable energy. So it's sort of companies that are, are operating in that space. So what you can see is if you've gone from a top 40 ETF, which is just the 40 largest in the JSC in South Africa, and now suddenly we're looking at fairly niche health, India, uh, you know, short dated US bonds, uh, infrastructure, smart city type of place. Typically, how I would look to, for, uh, to, to, to put together a portfolio is at the core of that portfolio, I would say, fine, let's have those boring broad ones, S&P 500. And in fact, we'll go even broader and we'll talk on that in a moment. Have those boring broad ones. And then we can use these more niche ones sort of as satellite. Uh, Signatrix, sustainable economy, uh, China, new China, we've now got two of those, uh, and the EMA coming through as well uh, from One Invest. Uh, so that, yes, the, the, the Asia one. So that One Invest one, I got my the, the, the wrong way around. Um, that, that is more looking at uh, uh, social responsible investing. Um, some changes. Cloud Atlas has been sold to the Purple Group. That's awaiting uh, compliance approval, regulatory approval, should happen in the next couple of months. The ETFs, which currently focus on Africa, will become actively managed ETFs. So they won't be passive. Satrix is buying ABSA. This was announced back in 2021. Uh, some of the deal is closed. We expect that to start happening again fairly shortly. Uh, CoreShares PREF ETF. This was a really great ETF, which uh, has been around for a decade or so now. Um, in fact, I spoke to Chris Rule on my money web show this morning about it. They get the PREF shares. So what you got is, in essence, an instrument paying interest, except it pays it at dividend. So if you're at a high tax threshold, this is a nice product to have. And that payment is linked to Prime. But the PREF market's been dying. Basel III requirements 10 years ago basically said PREF shares are no longer tier one capital and every year 10% less will be a tier one capital until now when it is zero. So we're not seeing new issuances. We're seeing liquidity dry up. We're seeing buybacks and closes of the PREF shares. So they're having to close that fund. There'll be a balloting process in April. If you hold it, you will be asked to vote. If the voting is says no, you can't close it, then ultimately that, well, you can't change it they will close the fund. They're looking to change it into a high yield SA bond uh, uh, ETF. They will buy the long dated bonds to catch the yield. It will give you a nice yield. The problem is, is the tax implication. That then comes as income rather than dividend. Uh, 
Uh, and core shares last year was sold to 10X. 10X are the uh, passive uh, RA and annuity providers. Core shares was sold to them. Uh, deal was concluded in December. I've chatted with uh, 10X. I've chatted with, with Gareth Stoby from Core Shares, uh, and it's not going to make any change to those. It's just, in a sense, 10X bulking up. And actually, I think a fairly good deal for them. So let's get to tax free. We've got some sense of what ETFs are and what we've been seeing in the market in the last couple of years. Let's get to tax free and the details of tax free. Introduced into the 2015 budget by then Finance Minister Nklanklanene. Uh, so the first time we could put money in was 1 March of 2015, which is effectively the 2016 tax year, which runs March through to February. There are limits. The limit is, was 30,000 a year. I'll come to that in a second and a lifetime limit of 500,000 rand per individual. You can only put 500,000 into your tax-free account, and you were limited initially at 30,000 a year, then 33,000 a year, and then finally 36,000 a year. So we've been able to put the last couple of years 36,000 rand a year into our tax-free account. And that's quite chunky. If you've got a family of four, uh, that's 12,000 rand a month or 144,000 rand a year. And if you're maxing it out, you're going to hit that limit in about 15 years. Will Treasury at some point change the 500,000 rand limit? Maybe, but it's moot. In, in, in five years' time, when we've been running these now for 14 years, then we start some people bumping up against that limit, and then it becomes a debate. Right now, that is completely moot. We have seen uh, changes to the annual limit, and this is limit per individual for a tax-free account. And importantly, not per tax-free account. You can't go open a tax-free account with three different providers and put 36 into each. It is 36,000 per person. And if you can't do the 36, that's fine. You don't get the benefit the next year, but it takes less off your limit, and I'm going to touch limits in a moment. So up to right now, you've been able to put 267,000 Rand into your tax-free at max. That means you've maxed it out every single year, the entire time it's been running. And important, those limits run tax year. So it's 1 March to 28 or 29 February, depending. So if you've maxed out in the current financial year, tax year, come 1st of March, which is a couple of weeks away, less than well, just over uh, uh, two weeks away, 1st of March, resets, your limit will be 36,000 Rand. You can start depositing money again. That is the slide as it goes along. And then I asked folks on Twitter, I said, okay, so how's your tax-free account doing? What is the value of your tax-free account? Now, of course, some people have maxed out and put the whole 267,000 Rand in. Some people simply haven't been able to. But I was also interested, if you put the 267,000, what's the value of your portfolio? So the majority were under 100,000. And that makes sense. You know, for many people, uh, you know, saving 36,000 a year, considering you're probably already doing some retirement savings via work, a, a pension, Provident, Reg 28 type of product. Uh, the 150 to 200,000, which is just under a third, 28% uh, at the 250 to 500,000. And then a few people, 4.1% of you, have got over half a million, which means you've taken your 267,000 and turned it into half a million. And I know what everyone out there is saying. Who are these people and how do they do it? I don't know who the people are because this is an anonymous Twitter poll. But I do know uh, one person in particular down in Durban who was trading their account and theirs is in excess of 500,000 uh, last I chatted to them. Once you've got the money in the tax-free account, you can buy and sell. So you could have last year gone and bought the Namibian bond at the beginning of the year for the entire account and done 28% return for the year. And the year before, in 2021, you could have gone and bought the Signia Fourth Industrial Revolution or the Satrix NASDAQ, and you would have done around 25 30% over the course of the year. I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. It sounds great, but there are a couple of big decisions that if we get wrong, things go horribly wrong. Do not exceed the limit. The 36,000 per individual per year and the 500,000 lifetime. Any money put in in excess, SARS penalizes at 40%. So if you put 40,000 in this year, you've put 4,000 in too much, they penalize that at 40%, they're going to charge you 1,600 Rand. What is important is who can open a tax free account? Anybody. 
It can be a, a newborn. It can be uh, someone who's just turned 100 years old. You don't need to prove a, 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 a tax number or anything. The requirement is, is that when the money is withdrawn, it goes into the bank account of the nominated individual. So don't go and try to do some fraud or anything like that. And of course, you've got to open a trading account, a tax-free account, which requires all the FICA documentation and the like. You can't do it for people not living in South Africa. You've got a, a, a granny in Australia. You can't do it for her. You need to be resident in South Africa. But here's the key point. It also has to be in a tax-free account. Don't just say, well, this is my tax-free account. All of the providers, the issuers, the, the ETF providers, everyone, uh, 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 stockbrokers, financial service providers and the like, they've all got dedicated tax-free accounts. You'll find them with your banking platforms. They're available everywhere. Make sure it is a tax-free account and not what we in the, in, in the industry call discretionary, which is taxed as per normal. So, no tax, really, no tax. There's two key taxes that are important, dividend withholding tax and CGT. And then the third one, tax on interest. Dividend withholding tax, that company makes a profit, they pay it to the issuer, and the issuer sticks it into your account because you've received it. What matters here is that there's typically a 20% tax on a dividend. You get paid a one rand dividend, SARS takes 20 cents, you get 80 cents. You never even see that 20 cents that goes straight to SARS. Here, you get the full one round. There's also no CGT, capital gains tax. When you sell and you make a profit, you're liable for capital gains tax. Now, capital gains tax, the first 40,000 every year is exempt from capital gains tax. Uh, from there, anything above that, 40% is added to your, to your income and taxed accordingly. So after the first 40,000 of capital gains, your max tax is 18% if you're in the 45% tax bracket already. But you don't pay capital gains. So profits are yours. And of course, interest income. We're going to talk more about interest income in a moment. But if you earn interest, there's a certain amount which is tax-free. And thereafter, it's added to your income. And you're taxed at income anything from 18 to, again, 45%. What matters here is that when you're in the tax-free environment, you can't put individual shares. And that is a risk assessment. And the point is quite simple. If you had put all your money into African Bank, it went bankrupt. Now what? Or Steinhoff, which was 70 Rand and today is 34 cents. In fact, I think it was 90 Rand. So you have to buy the collective investment schemes, which reduces the risk profile. Uh, there will obviously be state duty. If you die, they will cash out the, 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 the tax-free account. They will turn it into cash. It will form part of your estate. And if it's subject to estate duty, then you pay estate duty. You, of course, have bigger problems. You're dead. Uh, the, the tax free is not a worry here. What does matter is, as I said, transacting within the account, no problem. Drawing the money out, no tax to pay either. Whereas if you look at Red 28 products, you get a tax break when you put the money in. So if you put 100000 into your retirement annuity, you can deduct your income by 100000 or 27.5% or 350,000, whichever is smaller. But then when you take the Reg 28 money out in retirement, you pay tax. Here, you're using post-tax money, and then when you take it out at the other end, there's no tax to pay. In an ideal world, you want your tax-free account to be the last money that you spend because you want to give it the most amount of time to grow. And that's hugely important. Time is a huge factor here, and we'll look at some numbers in a moment which illustrate just how important that time is. There is some uh, drag on offshore dividends. So we've got a dual tax agreement with, uh, for example, the U.S. They charge 30% uh, uh, dividend tax. 50, half of that can be claimed back, but only half of it. So there is some drag if you're holding a Satrix uh, uh, or S&P 500 or a NASDAQ or a fourth industrial or that health or India or something like that. There is some drag. I'm going to talk in a bit about what are the best ETFs to have in a tax-free account. Deadline is 28 Feb for this tax year. And then it resets 1st of March. If you're scrambling and you're saying to yourself, hang on a sec, quickly, I want to get my money done uh, before the... Don't transfer money at 4 o'clock on the 28th of February. It's a Tuesday. Transfer the money next week or early the week after. Because you know what happens when you transfer money. It goes on holiday somewhere. And if it gets held up somewhere and it arrives on the 1st, it is then next year's deposit, not this year's deposit. And truthfully, 
you can shout until the cows come home. There's nothing anybody can do about it. So if you've got some quick money that you want to do, you need to do it sooner rather than later. Don't leave it until the last minute. But here is a cunning trick. You've got a retirement annuity and you've been get a tax back from that. Let's say you've put in 300,000 into your retirement annuity. Uh, and so you've, 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 yeah, you've put in 300,000 into your retirement annuity. So you can deduct that from your income, which means you pay less tax. So SARS gives you a refund. Use that refund to fund your tax-free account. Use the tax from your Reg 28 into your tax-free account. And in essence, it's using tax money to fund. Transfers. Uh, allowed from 1st of March 2018, so they started uh, three years after we actually started the tax-free accounts. Transfers are allowed. You can move from one tax-free provider or one tax-free account to another tax-free account to a different tax-free provider. You absolutely can. Why would you want to move? Perhaps you got the wrong product. A lot of people bought cash products. In other words, these are savings accounts, essentially. Particularly a lot of the banks were selling it. And, and you know, I'm not dissing the banks. We didn't know what we were doing. And some people end up and they're like, hang on, I've just got cash in here and I'm earning a measly interest rate uh, and I'm young and I want to have shares. You can transfer it. Maybe you're in an account that hasn't got the, a good product range. Perhaps the fees are too high. Because most tax-free accounts, you've got dis discount brokerage fees, zero admin fees, nice and cheap. If you want to transfer don't sell everything, take the money out and put it on the other side. That is a withdrawal. If you want to transfer, find your new provider, open a tax-free account with them, say, I want to transfer in, they'll give you forms. Go to your current provider, say, I want to transfer out, and they will give you forms. If you're transferring cash, no problem. If you're transferring ETFs from one broker to another broker, that's fine. If you're trying to transfer unit trusts into a stockbroking account, they're going to turn that into cash and then transfer the cash across. But no tax it, just do it within tax-free accounts. Make sure you practically do a transfer. And then sometimes I've heard of people being nailed by SARS, uh, and usually there's just been a misunderstanding on your uh, tax return. And it's quite easily and quite quickly cleaned up and you're off to the races again. With a tax-free account as well, you can only deposit cash. You can't say, well, I've got these ETFs, please can I put them into my tax-free account? No. And then the reason is because what value, what price to the, turn those ETFs into cash by selling them and then add them to a tax-free account. And he has another clever idea. Let's say you don't have 36,000 Rand lying around that you're going to sell, that you can deposit on the 1st of March into your tax-free account. Fair enough. 36 grand. A lot of money. It's tough out there. But maybe you've got some investments and some ETFs in your discretionary account and they're of 36,000 Rand. Well, okay, why don't you sell those ETFs? There might be a CGT event there, but remember you've got a 40,000 Rand exclusion. Sell that pool of 36,000 Rand of ETFs, put that cash into your tax-free account. And then every month you can go and buy a couple of thousand Rand of ETFs and rebuild your discretionary, and then every year sell it down and move it across. There will be some costs, brokerage fees. Uh, there won't be tax because the ex exemption on CGT is 40,000, you're only going to be moving 36. It's not all going to be profit. But it's another way to, 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 to work within the rules to make it more efficient. You can withdraw money. You can withdraw money whenever you like. JC works in a T plus three, which means if you put a sell order in tomorrow and all of your ETFs and say, send me the money, you'll have it on Tuesday or Wednesday ne next week. No problem whatsoever. You can withdraw Absolutely. But here's the problem with withdrawal. Your lifetime limit, remember, is 500,000. Let's say you've put 30,000 in. Your lifetime limit is now 470,000 remaining. If you draw that 30,000 out, your lifetime limit, <clears throat> excuse me, your lifetime limit remains 470,000. So deposits reduce your lifetime limit. So quite simply, you don't want to be withdrawing. You need to view this. Don't use your tax-free account for something you're going to do in five years, unless you're 85 years old, in which case, absolutely. But if you're a young and anything under 60, don't have a short term. Don't use this for to, get a, to build up a deposit for a house. Use a typical savings product for that. Don't use it for your wedding in a couple of years. This is the money you want to leave in there for as long as possible, decades 
decades and decades and decades. And I'll show you some numbers in a moment why. Transacting within the tax free is not a withdrawal. If you sell some ETFs and buy a different one, that's not a withdrawal. That is still within the tax free account. And you can do that as often as you want. You can absolutely do that as often as you want. Again, there's some pros and cons to it, and we'll come to them in a second. But it's taking that money out. So really, when you're putting money into your tax-free account, it needs to be money that you are deeply confident you're not going to need for 20, 30, 40 years' time. And I appreciate life throws curveballs, but in an ideal world, it's money that you don't need for many, many decades. Treat it like your pension fund, which you can't access. You can, but with massive penalties. So let's look at some numbers, because the numbers are great. They really are telling an epic story. Here's my favorite one. A child born today, you open them a tax-free account, and you can. They would obviously be featured by their guardian or their parents, as the case may be. Um, they'd be, have to have a birth certificate, but they don't need an ID book. They don't need that yet. They don't need a tax number. So a child born today, you put 36,000 Rand into their tax-free account, and that's all you do. When they turn 65 years old, that is now worth 2.9 million rand. Okay, so what are my assumptions here? I have done a 7% real return. In other words, 7% is the return minus inflation. So that 2.9 million rand is in today's spending money, not in 65 years' time, because 2.9 million rand will buy you a chappies. You've got 2.9 million rand's worth of money, and if you do the 4% rule, which says you draw 4% out every year and you use that for your living expenses, that gives you 117,000 Rand per year tax free. 10 grand a month, the rest of your life, and it's increasing at 7% a year, ahead of inflation. Now you're going to say 117,000 is only 10 grand a month, that's not much of a retirement, and you are correct. I plan to drink wine in my retirement, lots of it. But all you did was make one deposit of 36,000 Rand. Imagine if you maxed it out to half a million Rand and then left it until age 65. So you started on the day the kid is born, you maxed out that tax free, which will happen when they're about 15 years old, and then you leave it until they're 65, they've got 27 million Rand, and taking 4% just gives you over just over a million Rand a year. That is. I'm trying to do the math in my head. Let's call it 90,000 a month. 90,000 rand a month in today's money, tax-free. And when you die, you're going to leave a giant pool of money to your heirs, which will get estate tax the heck out of it. But you've had a good life. And here's the thing. And there are a couple of things. Firstly, you do this, it means that your child never needs to worry about saving for retirement during their working career, which means they've got more spending money. Perhaps they could have a job which maybe earns less, but is more satisfying, less stressful. Or it means perhaps they can look after their parents in the parents' retirement because they're not having to put aside 15, 20, 25% every month to saving for retirement because it was done for them before they were old enough to know what was happening. Here's the risk. When the kid turns 18, this is their account. And I remember being 18. I was many things. None of them were responsible. But you've got 18 years from when the child was born to when it turns 18 to make them responsible, to teach them and help them understand the implications. So but let's keep that number in mind. So you started at day birth and you ran it for 65 years and it was worth 27 million and some change. Again, 7% real return. That is in today's money. Let's keep that 7% real return, but let's do it a 40-year investment. Because for most of us, we're not born, right? We're, we're old. We, in fact, many of us don't even maybe have 40 years. Heck, in 40 years, I will be proper old. But if you're in your 20s or 30s, 40 years is a reasonable time frame. And you max out contributions every year until you hit your limit. And its value is 4.9 million instead of 27. Look what those extra 25 years do. Time is your single biggest asset as an investor. The more time you have, the better it is. Now, again, a 4% drawdown here pays you 195,000 Rand a month, a year, sorry. That is in today's money and it is tax free. You could, however, because I assumed a 7% real return, you could do a 7% drawdown. 
because what we're assuming in a 7% real return is markets did 11% growth, inflation was 4 so your real return is 7%. That is growth, say 5%, dividends, say 2%. And that gives you your 7% return. But because this is adjusted for inflation, you could do a 7% drawdown and get yourself 342000 a year. Again, is that retirement money? Mm, no, I mean, it is. Don't get me wrong. There are a lot of people who live on less. But let's also be clear. You've been saving other money, right? You've got a Reg 28, retirement, provident, pension, preservation fund, whatever the case may be. You've also got perhaps some discretionary money. This isn't your only source of retirement income. If you put it in a taxed account, you get 825,000 less and you get 60,000 less per year. So that's the benefit of the tax-free. It is significant. I mean, you know, 825,000 is running the number 16% more just by saving on that tax over time. So the question, what to buy? Uh, and I've got some thoughts on this. First of all, and just one lap, we've been asking our faves what they think we should buy. Uh, we've got Nzipo van Heerden, we've got S, we've got Sambeck Messenger, uh, Charles Savage from Easy Equities Purple Capital, myself, we've got Sol Ferry from uh, Facebook and Twitter, Rochelle. We've said to them, what are you buying? What, what's in your portfolio? What are your favorite ETFs? And they've very graciously told us. And I'll let you in a secret, uh, in about two weeks' time, we'll have David Shapiro's uh, ETFs that he likes. So that, you know, should we blindly follow what somebody else does? No. But is it interesting to see what other people are doing to peek into their portfolios? Oh, you bet you. And can we perhaps learn something from that? Yes. I mean, Rochelle mentioned ETFs I'd never heard of. David mentioned an ETF which I've mentioned before and reviewed. So it gives us some insight. Same with Sandback Messenger and all of them. They've all got these little ideas and things and it just gets us thinking and it's like, hmm, hang on. I'm buying this, but what about that? And we don't want FOMO, and we don't want to follow people, and we don't want to you know, do the YOLOs and all of those sort of things. I appreciate that, but it's nice to peek, if only because as human beings, we are deeply inquisitive. Here's what I like for an ETF, is one ETF to rule them all. And what I mean by that? A single global ETF. I've been talking about Indian ETFs and, and uh, uh, bespoke ones, NASDAQ ETFs, fourth industrial revolution, resources, financials, even top 40. They were all quite niche. There are a couple of global ones. There's the F&B 1200, which doesn't include any Africa. There's the global from core shares, which is the one I prefer. Why? It's got 9,000 shares. It includes a lot of emerging market exposure, about 14% into emerging markets, uh, and does include some Africa exposure. There's the Glow Div, also from Core Shares. What that is doing, it is a dividend aristocrat. So it's focusing on high quality shares. How do we determine quality? Well, have you paid dividends for the last 25 years? If the answer is yes, you can be in there. If the answer is no, yeah, sorry. Uh, again, some e EM, but no Africa. There's the uh, Satrix uh, developed markets, and there's the Signia US, which is the S&P 500. The thing with the Signia, with the, with the S&P 500, and in fact, there are a couple of S&P 500s. There's a core shares, there's a Signia. I've just picked the cheapest one there in terms of ter ditto with the developed markets only from Satrix. The thing with the S&P 500 is it's, yeah, it's the 500 biggest companies in America. But what's the biggest one then? Apple. Uh, my camera is an iPhone. My laptop is a MacBook Pro. And somewhere there is an iPad. Yes, it's an American company, but they trade globally, as does McDonald's, as does Coca-Cola. So they're American companies, but they are global. And they are in emerging markets because we're in emerging market. And you know what? We can get Apple and McDonald's and Coca-Cola in South Africa. So... I like the idea of one ETF to rule them all, and I certainly do that in my discretionary account. And if you go to justonelap.com slash ETFs, you will find that every week we do an ETF review. It's either one of our faves, uh, and if you've got someone who you think we should absolutely be including, drop it in. We will request them to, to do it, and, 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 and they might say no. Uh, we've got a bunch of people on our list already, uh, and of course they have every right to say uh, thanks, but no. But so far, everyone said, sure, why not? So we do those weekly blogs as well. You can find the faves there, just fundlab.com slash faveetfs, 
or just go to justonelab.com slash ETFs. We review them, we come up with cunning ideas, but what else to put in there? So Nuina Fisser from ETFSA, who is the smartest person, just the smartest person, but on ETFs, even more so the smartest person, she did a brilliant power hour for us back in August 2020 on managing all of our portfolio. Because of course we've got tax free and we've got our reg 28 and we've got some discretionary and maybe we've got some offshore and we own a property and a car and a Narina delves into all of that. Just from that.com slash power hour, scroll down. You've got to find the one from two and a half years ago. She did one last year. It was also great, but go back and find this one. Proactive passive management. Probably something that she has uh, trademarked herself. Should you have cash? in a tax-free account? The answer is no, unless. So firstly, if you're under 65, the first 23,800 Rand per year is tax-free of interest anyway. If you're over 65, the first 34,500 Rand of interest is tax-free. Thereafter, added to your income and taxed accordingly. Those numbers have not changed since the 2015 budget, and I think they won't change because I think Treasury is saying, use your tax-free account. If you are needing income, and you've got cash and you've got tax challenges because of the cash, then absolutely have a cash tax-free account. You'll find many providers offering seven, eight, some maybe even eight and a half percent return. And if you're already exceeding the 34 and a half or the 23,800 of interest every year, then yes, get what you can extra out of a tax-free account. But if you're not exceeding those limits and you don't need the interest income, don't. Because Shares, equity, ETFs beat cash over the long term. Last year, they didn't, but that's the exception. As a rule, over the long term, they absolutely do. Property companies, REITs, real estate investment trusts. So real estate investment trusts, distributions are taxed as income. Long story behind it, uh, there'll be an article in just one lap next week around that. I'm not going to go into all the, the whys and the the REIT Act and everything else. But when a REIT, which is a property company, and they will own shopping centers and distribution centers and logistics and, unfortunately, office parks too. When those REITs pay dividends, it's not a dividend. It's called a dividend. But it's not taxed as a dividend would be taxed, which is 20%. It is added to your income and taxed accordingly. And if you earn over 236,000 Rand per year, your tax is more than 20%. It's going to be 26% and scaling up. So REITs are great because they pay nice yields. You can get yields of 6, 7, 8, 9% on, on, on the capital and you get the capital appreciation. But there's a tax hit on it but not if it's in a tax-free account. So if you are holding REIT ETS, and there are three of them local ones, I'm not looking at the offshore. There's the core shares property, there's a Satrix property, and there's a one invest property. If you're holding any or all of those in your tax-free, in, in your normal account, you're better off holding it in your tax-free account because there will be a tax saving for you if you earn over 236,000 Rand per year. If you earn less, then your tax rate is only 18%, and dividend tax is 20, so what the heck, you're better off. But REITs are a good product to have in here, except for the problem. Yeah, that is the chart of the index of the real estate investment trust, well, actually the property stocks on the JSE. Now you can actually see they peaked ahead of the, the, the pandemic. What had happened? I mean, REITs, quickly let me go down a rabbit hole. Back in the day, property stocks, when I was learning about markets in the 80s and 90s, property stocks were, you bought them at discount to net asset value. In other words, that building's worth a million rand, you want to buy it for 900,000. Why is someone selling it to you for 900,000? Doesn't matter. But do you want to buy it for 1.2 million when it's only worth a million? Don't be silly. But at that peak there in 2017, you were paying a one and a half million rand for a one million rand building. That No one goes to a show day and says, I love this house, three million. Here, I tell you what, I'll give you five. Nonsense. You say three million, how about two and a half? So we were paying premium for property, which is ridiculous. And then the yields, typically, which is the, the dividends that you receive, the interest that you receive, that rate should be above your, your, your government rate. And they weren't, but now they are. They're trading at between 15 and 50% of the value of the buildings. And I, we all know why, right? Particularly the office has been decimated. Uh, load shedding is not helping. Huge costs coming in there. But I've got to say, this is a sector that I like long-term. 
I don't like Office. I think Office has huge problems. And in those three ETFs, there will be some Office. But the big Office guys have been hit hard. So they are, remember, the biggest stock has the biggest weight. The smallest stock has the smallest slice. So properties there, but not too big. And you can go and check. All of these funds have an MDD, minimum disclosure document. And you can go see which are the top 10 holdings. And then you can delve into it and see, well, what are they? Some of them are not even operating in South Africa. They're in Eastern Europe. So I like REITs in here. The recovery has been modest and uh, is remaining modest, to be honest. But uh, I like REITs, and I'm putting my REITs in here, those that I do have, because it's more tax efficient. Offshore, there's a drag on dividends. Remember, I mentioned it earlier. America charges the 30% dividend withholding tax. We only charge 20, but America charges 30. But because that money is going offshore to South Africa, they credit half of it back. But we still pay a 15% dividend tax. Now, that drag is about, depending on the yield, it's 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a percent. It is not massive by any stretch. But if you're you know, focusing on those small little numbers, offshore ETFs in your tax-free account is a bad idea because of that drag that you're going to get. Now, you can go to IRS and say, hey, what about our tax-free? IRS is like, we don't know who you are or what that is. We're not interested. The global ETF, which is my preferred, doesn't get any of that at all. They pay 30% on US dividends. So don't put global in a tax-free, put it in your discretion. It, mean, it means there's a drag of about half a percent a year, which I lose to the American government, which does not thrill me. But there are worse things out there. Tactical. So I spoke earlier, and we saw a couple of people have actually grown their 267,000 into over half a million. How they've done it, they've been trading. They've been tactical in a sense. And what that means is that they buy and sell, you know, so they look out and they say, I want to own this one, not that one. And that's great if you get it right. But you've got to make three big decisions. What are you going to buy? When are you going to buy it? And then when do you sell it? If you get any of those wrong, you're getting risk, not reward. So this is very possible. Most people I know are using very, very simple technical analysis more than anything else. A couple of moving averages, and they're picking sectors that way. And it absolutely can work. But you've got to be careful, because if you get it wrong, it can hurt. Monthly versus lump sum. This is the question you always get. Should I put my 36,000 in on the 1st of March or should I do 3,000 rand a month? The math is quite simple. Put it all in on the 1st of March because markets as a rule rise. I know last year they didn't. But in 2021, if you put the money in on the 1st of March versus monthly, you would have done much better on the 1st of March. Last year, if you'd done it monthly, you would have done much better. But that's the exception, not the rule. The point is sleeping well at night. That fear of taking 36,000, clicking the button, your broker pops up a pop-up that says, are you sure? And the answer is not even a little bit sure. I'm scared. So if it stresses you, do three a month until you get comfortable. Or maybe three grand a week for 12 weeks, whatever. Sleeping, being rich is nice, but sleeping is more important. Being stress-free is way more important. than, 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 than. So, so do what works for you. I do lump sum, 1st of March, in goes 36,000. Do what works for you. The math says lump sum. So trading in your tax free, I've said already, absolutely, it is not a withdrawal. It is entirely possible. You can get great returns, but watch the risk. Trading is not easy. So some burning questions, and then I'll come to your questions. I've answered some of these already. Can I open for my kids? Yes. You have to do FICA for you. It will be the parent or the guardian's FICA. They don't need an ID book or anything like that. They do need a birth certificate. Um, and a stockbroker can't open for under seven years old, but an FSP can. So if you try to open one and you get told, sorry, no, can't, it's a stockbroker, find an FSP. Uh, is it worth starting if I'm old? Yes, absolutely. You know what? Every budget day, and our budget this year is 22nd of, of February. Every budget day, finance minister stands up and essentially takes money out of our pocket with taxes. Not right? taxes, taxes. And we pay more. Here, the finance minister is putting money back in your pocket. If you have no discretionary money, well, then no, don't open it. But if you've got 10,000 rand lying around, you don't know what to do with it, and it's sitting in some account gathering dust, or maybe you've got a, an ETF or something, put it in a tax-free account. What's the worst that happens? You don't get any major benefit. But maybe you live for 30 years. So yes, don't worry about being old. Stick it in, even if you're 95. 
Can I change the ETFs I hold? Yes, you can. Sell the ones you have, buy the ones that you like. There are about 100, uh, it's about 70 ETFs that you can buy into your tax-free account. And if the, if, if, if the provider that you have doesn't have a range that you like, change providers. Do a transfer, not a withdrawal. Can you have more than one tax-free account? You can have as many tax-free accounts as you like. But the limit is 36,000 Rand per year for the individual. So don't go and open five and put 36,000 Rand into each. You will be penalized 40% on all the excess. Why would you have multiple? I have no idea, but I'm sure there are some reasons and some people have, have got multiple and with very strong reasons for it, but no. Um, question which I saw a moment ago, uh, can I get one for each member of my family? Sure. A couple with two kids, you can each put in 36,000 for the four of you. That's 144K, hey? the numbers get big fast, but absolutely you can. Uh, will the limits increase? So as I said, the 500,000 lifetime limit, we'll start to worry about that in about five years' time. I think Treasury might actually up it a bit. Eh, maybe. But that's not a worry. Will the annual limit increase? I think it might. I, if, if I, I think there's a chance it'll increase in the budget speech in two weeks' time. And here's why. If you look at what they did initially, it was 30, then it went to 33 for three years, then it went to 36 for three years. Well, now we've been here three years. Shouldn't we move it to 40? I also think it's something which government can do, which will make us happier, because it's not going to be a very fun budget, so it'll make us smile a bit. And it doesn't cost them money, because it's post-tax money. It costs them money in time, so it kicks the can down the road. So I think the limit will go to 40,000. But we wait for the finance minister to speak uh, on 22nd, uh, Wednesday 22nd, 2 o'clock, and then we will know. Tax-free or retirement annuity? And retirement annuity is Reg 28, pension, provident, whatever the case may be. Both. The answer is both. So when we were doing the podcast with Christia van Heerden, Fat Wallet, uh, we got this question a lot, and someone actually ran the numbers. And they said, you know what? There's no difference. What matters is actually how much money you deposit in. Now, you can put more into a, into a Reg 28 because there's no limit. There's limits in what you can claim. Uh, 350,000 or 27.5%, whichever is smaller. So there is a limit on that. But even if you put in excess, if you, know, if you put 500,000 into your uh, Reg 28, you've put in an extra 150,000. So you can claim the tax back on the 350, but not the extra 150. But you can take that 150 that you put in and you can roll the tax benefit into next year or the year after or some year when you don't. So when you're getting close to retirement, you can quickly max out and reduce into retirement some tax liability. So tax-free or retirement annuity, but you want to max out as much as you can. And just a quick point here. We're always focusing on how much we can save. There's the other side of that coin, which is how much we spend. Attack the spending. And I know it is tough out there and it's not going to get easier in a hurry. Uh, what about holding cash? Touched on that. Unless you are already exceeding the tax-free limits on interest and need it, don't. Uh, what about crypto? There is no crypto in any of these. Nope, not even within 100 miles. If you want crypto, that is completely and absolutely discretionary. So to review, everyone should open them. I have not in all the years heard an even slightly compelling argument as to why you shouldn't open a tax-free account. Yeah, people say, oh, but I don't want to invest in South Africa. Well, then buy offshore ETFs in, in rands. And when the rand weakens, you make money. And then as that goes up, you make money. So don't stress that. Um, ignore short-term market gyrations. You know, 2020, our market collapsed 30-odd percent in a matter of weeks ahead of the pandemic or ahead of our lockdown, and then recovered almost as quickly, had a brilliant 2021, and then collapsed again last year. Markets in the short term will gyrate. In the long term, they go up. They have done forever and a day. Keep it simple. What's your costs? So most tax-free accounts are charging 0.2 or 0.25% uh, brokerage fee. Uh, there's no STT to pay because they're ETFs. There is a benefit. Uh, we get a lower straight amount. But watch those fees. Watch the admin fees as well. Um, I particularly don't like admin fees that are a percentage of the money. But, I mean, Nurina Fisser again did a webcast for us many years ago on why it depends. I mean, if there's value there, that's fine. 
and fill up your tax free every year before other investments. And I'm not talking Reg 28, that's the pension. But if you've got a discretionary account and you're buying shares in ETS there, maybe local, maybe offshore, fine, but fill your tax free up first. Cool. Let's get to some questions. I'm going to kill that camera because now I am off screen. Folks, if you've got questions, drop them into the Q&A box. We've got some time. Uh, lots of folks asking if it will be available later this evening. Uh, it will. I will drop. It will be at just onelap.com slash power hour. It will be at that URL uh, late this evening. Full video. Um, why, uh, uh, best platform for your tax free account? You know what? They're mostly all the same. I, I mean, for example, all the banks have got them and they're perfectly good and perfectly fine. Easy Equities has got a good one, but all the stockbrokers have got one. Um, what do they do? I mean, they, and they're all at about the same rate 0 0.25, 0 0.2, no admin fees, etc. So if you've already got a brokerage account or you've got a bank account, go have a look and, and see what's available right there. Uh, what do I think Alan Gray and Fed Group that put their tax free accounts in the diamond wrapper, nominate beneficiaries and there's no executors, fees, estate duty is still payable. Yo, look, I, I don't know the products. They starting to sound a little bit complex. I'm not adverse to them. Uh, check what there is in terms of cost around that. Those costs could be quite a drag. Michael, does SARS allow one to mistakenly transfer more than the annual limit? No. Michael, as I understand, they don't. Um, and as I understand, you can't withdraw it because that won't hit either. Speak to your broker. See if they've had any experience with it. I, I know people who've put too much in. Um, they were unaware and they got hit with the limit. I'm not sure what that story is there. But uh, it, it, my sense is, I mean, size is not the most forgiving bunch of peeps in the world. Hey? So they might be hitting you that 40%. But speak to your broker and maybe even speak to SARS. Uh, Warren Ingram for his favorite ETS. Yep, Warren Ingram is on our list. Uh, please say, hold on, please say some more where you would put global if not in your tax free. Would you then suggest for one of the holding the tax free account? Yeah, so I buy the global ETF every single month on a debit. Um, and I just put it to my discretionary account. Now, I actually have a cheap brokerage account via my bank, um, which charges me only 0.25%. And so every month, bang, off goes a debit. I buy the global ETF outside of my tax free account. And then in my tax free account, I've got property, I've got some tactical and some other uh, uh, bits and pieces. So you don't have to have ETFs in your tax free account. You can uh, have it wherever. Uh, Michael, absolute pleasure. Glad you enjoyed. Uh, Chris, what ETS do you own and in what proportion? So I'm one of the faves. Go to just one lap slash, just one lap dot com slash ETFs and you will see my holding. Or go to my vanity website, simonbrown.co. My entire portfolio is published there. ETFs are about almost 60% of my portfolio, more or less. It changes from day to day. I'm increasing that number. My biggest holding in that is uh, Satrix, the FMB 1200, and Global. Satrix for legacy reasons, and if I sell, I've got massive tax liabilities because I was buying that thing at six rand an ETF, and now it is 75 rand an ETF. Uh, the FMB 1200, because it used to be my preferred, and then Global. If I saw the global ETF, which one should I buy? Uh, I wouldn't say to sell it. I mean, it's a it's my favorite ETF. It is absolutely my favorite ETF. The problem is there's a slight drag on the dividends, which equates to a, an extra 0.3% per year, which I'm comfortable with. I, that, that, you know, if my retirement is ruined because of 0.3%, then, then I've done something wrong. Yeah, I'm still going to be drinking wine out of a bottle, not a box. So uh, maybe I'm drinking a slightly older, uh, slightly younger vintage. I'm drinking the 21 instead of the 2020. That's fine. I, my, my, I'm not that good. So I, 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 I like my global. I just think there's better use in the tax-free account to use it for either uh, directly into uh, property, into more tactical, um, or a, a s and 500 or the like. Uh, sure, we talked around which and a whole bunch. I'm going to assume uh, Jonathan uh, Best, which was the best. 
Uh, let's go back to that. A couple of folks are asking about this. There they are. So those are the five. The global is the one I like. I hold some of the FNB. The Globe Dev is very nice because it's mature stocks. So it's it's like toothpaste, right? Even during a recession, we're still brushing our teeth, right? You're not at that point because we're still brushing our teeth. Um, this one, World, is developed markets only. Uh, the S&P is a great product. I mean, any one of those is a great single ETF to have in a portfolio. And yes, there's a bit of a drag on the global, but really it is absolutely tiny. Understand that a tax free to open to a South African citizen only. Uh, South African resident. South African, okay, now I'm getting confused. No, I, no, that's actually, I know a Botswanan woman who is a South African resident. She's born in Botswana, she's resident of South Africa, and that she has a tax free account. Um, and maybe she slipped through the cracks, but they want you to be resident. That's the point. And then the money goes back into a bank account in South Africa. Sven, my parents have some money in discretion in the Citrix 40. Should I keep it there or perhaps uh, expenses coming up or other investments? Uh, slowly cash it in. So, and if they've got money in discretionary, I would sell 36,000 for each of them every tax year and move that 36,000 into a tax free account. You might then just go and buy Citrix 40 again. That's a perfectly viable option, but it, it gives them that tax benefit. On the sale of the 36,000, there will be some perhaps CGT to pay. But unless they've got other capital gains, it's well within the 40,000 Rand limit. There will be some transaction fees, uh, but they will be relatively small. Sell the ETF, transfer the money into tax free, and uh, do that every year until they run out of money. Mark, uh, where do we say we can find one's favorite ETFs? The favorite ETFs are just one lap.com slash fave ETFs. Uh, how do companies know not to pay the withholding tax to SARS? Um, Peter, that's a great question. I honestly don't know. Hmm. When, when companies declare dividends, they declare, well, actually, because there's a couple of things. So if you are a company receiving, only individuals pay dividend withholding tax. If you're a company receiving a dividend, you don't pay withholding tax. It will get paid when you pay it to the, the shareholders. Um, so there's a way which SARS is able to flag and I'm, it must happen at the provider level where they're able to flag an account and say, this is an individual, therefore 20% DWT. This is a tax-free account, therefore none. But Peter, great. I'm going to go dig around and find an answer for that I, because I don't know. Rhea, absolute pleasure. I will, uh, the case for exceeding the annual limit and paying the 40%. Uh, <laughs> so I was saying, why don't I drop a million rand into my tax-free account? SARS is going to come along and penalize me at 40%, which means I'm going to pay 400,000 of penalty. But do I win over the long term because I had all that money tax-free? The answer, Ivor, is that the math, assuming you're talking decades, says yes. Here's what I don't know. Does SARS make you take that money out? I mean, is, I mean would, would SARS let Christo Visa take a billion rand, put it into a tax-free account, pay a 400 million rand penalty, and then have all the other 600 million tax-free? As I read the act, the answer is yes. I just don't know because we haven't tried it long enough yet, and I can't find anyone who's tried it. I know some folks have exceeded, they've paid the penalty, but it's been small amounts. But the math says yes. And yeah, I, I, let me leave it there. The math says yes, but I don't know what SARS says. Uh, Miss, sir, thank you for the awesome session. If I contribute my tax fee this month, but only reflecting the provider, is that considered? So if, if it only reflects, if what matters is the day it reflects in the account. So if it reflects on the 1st of March or later, it is the next tax year. If it reflects on the 28th of February or sooner, it is considered this tax year. It's when it reflects, that is what matters. Alicia, uh, would you advise holding an ETF across the full TF term or selling it when it drops and rebuying the same? So, Alicia, I mean, the ideal world, your ETF goes up, you sell it, it falls, you rebuy it, and you do a whole lot better. That is not easy to do is the honest answer. For the vast majority of people, myself included, it's easier just to hold it um, over the period. They will drop, but they will recover. Because remember, you've got to make two decisions, when to sell and when to buy. And you don't want to sell because the thing's going to the moon. And then you don't want to buy it because it's crashing. So it's hard. 
You need vice for those of us who hold Cloud Atlas, Sovereign, Bond, Sonar, take the 40% loss or keep holding as it is reacquired. Um, so I don't know how you're going to get paid out. There's almost certainly going to be a loss. I mean, Maurice Madiba, who, who put together Cloud Atlas, he, he, he just struggled with liquidity and costs and everything else. I thought they were a great product, but they, they never got the, 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 the size that, we, that we'd wanted or hoped for. Um, my advice, I mean, I, I, you know, within a couple of months, it'll, it'll, it'll change, and therefore it, it'll, you'll effectively have be booted out of it. So if it's currently rising, don't sell. If it's currently falling, take the money and run. Uh, Clinton, Folks, I know I've ever run my time. I'm going to go through the questions. Um, and as I said, this has been recorded, so we'll catch it later. As a tax-free portfolio, should we wait for the ETF share price to drop before buying it? Yeah, but then what happens if it doesn't drop? You know, our market was up 9% in January. It was up 20% from the beginning of October. Um, you know, is it going to now drop and you get a better price? Maybe. But what if it doesn't? I mean, now we're talking trading. Can you trade in, in a tax-free? Yes. Is trading hard? Absolutely it is. For the vast majority of people, buy, hold, leave it at that. Offshore domestic REITs. Uh, so I prefer domestic. So I, I have no problem with offshore REITs. But the, the local REITs is where we get the really good tax advantage in terms of um, the, the tax-free account. I hold some of the offshore. I've got the, the property 40, whatever it is, global property one. Um, but am I tax free? I want the local REITs. Uh, about bond ETFs generally. Yeah, it's a good point. I didn't really talk about bond ETFs. I mean, they serve a purpose, but they really are for retirement when you are looking to maximize income. Um, and we, we, we've got some articles in just one lap. If you go to uh, that link, just on lap.com slash ETF. So just search for bonds on the website. You will find some information there as well. Um, I got no problem with bond ETFs. Uh, I don't touch on them because I think they're a very, very niche product. They're good to sit in a tax-free account because, again, they pay interest. So if you're looking to hold them, they're the right place to hold it. Uh, every shareholder full in the form, if you could exempt from dividend uh, withholding tax. Uh, I think if you're talking offshore, yes, but you still, so if you've got offshore, dividend withholding is 30. If you do a Ben 10 um, or WB10 or whatever it's called, you only pay 15%, but they still keep 15. Uh, Clinton, got it. Okay, ladies and gents, I'm going to park that there because we have hit the time and we are finished the questions. If you've got more questions, uh, contact details for me. Uh, there we go. Uh, SimonBrown.coza is my vanity site. You'll find what I do, what I hold, and contact details. I'm on all the social medias. Uh, there's the Twitters and the like. If you've got questions, find me questions. Always happy to take more. Ladies and gents, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, I hope everyone has a good evening further. As always, look after yourself. If you can, Look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.